From the College by the Lake, meeting the personalities and discussing the issues that affect all of Coeur d'Alene and the Inland Northwest, we are the North Idaho College Public Forum. And now, here's your moderator, political scientist, Tony Stewart. Oftentimes, we return to a subject that we dealt with many years ago, and as many of you in our audience know, this is the 19th year of our program, and I was checking our records, and we did a program in 1973 on the Baha'i faith, or religion, and we're returning to that subject after a number of years. We're very pleased to welcome to the program two individuals who are certainly qualified to discuss that religion. I first of all welcome to the program, to my far left, Peter Vaughn from Moscow. He is a member of the Baha'i Faith and he is uh, on the local spiritual assembly uh, in Moscow and we welcome Peter to the program. Thank you. And I'm equally happy to have on the program Carol Hudson who is in the Post Falls community of the Baha'i Faith and we'll be talking later about the structure. I understand that uh, in the community that she's in that those in North Idaho and Eastern Washington make up what is called Electoral District. And Carol, we are very pleased that you can be with us. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's our attempt to assist you today in uh, looking into a religion. We do different religions from time to time on a comparative basis, and as I've indicated, we're very pleased to be able to do that. As always, I would like to welcome to our panel Janelle Burke, who is an attorney in the state of Idaho, and I shall ask Janelle to commence the questioning. Peter, for the benefit of our viewers who may not be acquainted with the Baha'i Faith, can you tell us a little bit about how did this start? What was the history and the background of the Baha'i? Be happy to. The Baha'i Faith began in 1863 with the declaration of Baha'u'llah, whose uh, name was Mirza Hussein Ali, and he took the title Baha'u'llah, which means the glory of God. Baha'is believe that Baha'u'llah is one in a continuum of ma messengers from God, starting with Abraham, coming through Moses, Zoroaster, Krishna, Buddha, Christ, Muhammad, Baha'u'llah. And he was preceded by a gentleman uh, named the Bab, who in Islamic tradition and in biblical tradition uh, preceded him by 19 years. This is very significant in terms of time if you're involved in num numerology. He made his de declaration in the year 1844 on the same night that William Morris made the telegraph connection and typed out uh, What Hath God Wrought as his first message in fulfillment of an Islamic tradition that the next messenger of God would come in the year 1260, which happens to be 1844 in the Christian calendar, and that he would be announced by the tapping of metal on metal to give his forth his name. Baha'u'llah's tradition and background is traced through from Abraham if you go through lineology. His teachings are for the oneness of the human race, the oneness of religion, and the unity and unification of mankind. And that's his basic principles. We have many others that we can elaborate as we go into them. But in 1863, and we, the United States, as you know, was involved in a civil war. Baha'u'llah addressed this country and said that we had to solve our racial problems uh, before we could progress to our spiritual attainment that we are destined to do in America. And he's written many tablets to America telling us what our spiritual destiny is and world destiny is as a nation. And part of that is being fulfilled as we sit and speak today. And so from that start, then, what happened from there? From his declaration in 1863, the Baha'i Faith has circumambulated the world. There are Baha'i National Assemblies in over 153 countries of the world. We have Baha'is in all the countries of the Iron Curtain. There are Baha'is in China. Uh, as a result of the dispersity of Baha'is throughout various political regimes, Baha'is do not involve themselves in the politics of their local country. We, if we do so, such as in countries of the Middle East and some of the key countries that before perestroika uh, behind the Iron Curtain, uh, the Baha'is would be heavily persecuted if the Baha'is of the West got involved in politics, so we don't. We obey the laws of our country, but we don't get involved in the politics of those countries. And Carol, can you tell us a little bit about the organizational structure of the Baha'i faith? I'd be glad to. Um, basically, it begins um, from the local community level, where um, if there are nine adult members, they are able to elect a local spiritual assembly, which governs then that community's um, affairs, and that actually is 
uh, an assembly that is available to the community at large, not just to the Baha'is, as far as for consultation. Uh, it's elected annually. Um, when that body is, is functioning, it is an administrative and a spiritual body. The individuals that are on that local assembly, as individuals, have no weight or power. And that local assembly is uh -huh. composed of how many people? That would be uh, nine individuals, okay. adults. Um, from that, they would elect, of course, a, a chairman and a secretary and, and treasurer and such. Um, from that uh, level, you have the National Spiritual Assembly. It also is elected annually. Its election is um, done through the electoral process of um, no campaigning, no electioneering, secret ballot only. Um, the delegates that attend the National Convention are elected from their district. Um, our district is uh, Northern Idaho, Eastern Washington. Um, we have uh, our delegate that would um, go to the National Convention in April, elect the National Spiritual Assembly. Then those nine individuals serve as the administrative head for the United States. In this case, other countries uh, likewise do the same. Uh, from that, every five years, each uh, National Spiritual Assembly will gather in the Holy Land in Haifa, Israel, and elect the uh, international governing body. Uh, its uh, name is uh, the Universal House of Justice, and it's also uh, of nine individuals who are elected uh, every five years, and they administer to the Baha'i world at large. And if asked for uh, uh, problem solving and consultation by um, heads of state, it wouldn't matter whether it would be uh, an individual or a government official, if they wanted to take advantage of the council from this international body, they are, are free to do so. But uh, it's basically for the Baha'i world. And when are they next due to be elected? When is the next five-year um, period, do you know? I'm try I believe it will be uh, one more year, I believe. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, Peter, would you know, is it one or in, two? In uh, uh, 93. In 93. Okay. And uh, can you tell us something about where is the headquarters of the Baha'i Faith? Okay. As far as the international headquarters yes. is in Haifa, Israel, on the side of Mount Carmel. Uh, there are uh, holy places uh, for Baha'i pilgrims that, uh, if they are free to go to the Holy Land, uh, can go on a nine-day pilgrimage to the key um, Baha'i uh, holy places. That would include the places where the founder Baha'u'llah uh, lived in imprisonment in Akka, in the fortified city there in Akka, and later when he passed away in 1892, um, they can go to his shrine where he is buried, as well as the prophet founder, the Bob's uh, remains are also uh, on Mount Carmel. I'd like to follow uh, upon this process, when we do programs on religion and comparative religions, we talk about the dogma or principles of each re organized religion or religious faith. And Peter, when you started out, you were most eloquent, as Carol was most eloquent in talking about your particular faith. Uh, as I heard you talk about your original leader, founder, and, and, and the second one, it came to mind that now you do not have in the Baha'i faith, a particular individual, but you have a, a, a nine-member council, I suppose mm -hmm. it's called. Is it going to stay that way, or is there, within the doctrine itself, the possibility of another leader like the Bob uh, in the future? Yes, most definitely. Baha'u'llah and the Bob both talked about a messenger that would come in not less than a thousand years. The principle is that when God made a covenant with Abraham, and he said, I will never leave you bereft of a teacher. And so like the teacher in our schools as we come up, now we're at the college level here where we're sitting today, each level we've had a teacher that can give us information. They knew much more than they could share with us, but they gave us the information at the level of which we were there at. As Christ said, I have many things to teach you, howbeit when he the Son of Truth shall come and lead you unto all truth. We believe that at the time of Muhammad, one of his names is this, or titles is the Seal of the Prophets. Now, the Islamic world says that he can never th be followed by anyone else. And they have missed his teachings, which says there will be someone who will come in the year 1260. They conveniently miss that in many cases. Uh, in the Christian tradition, in the period 1863, 1844, that whole sequence of 19 years, 
Yeah, you had the birth of the Seven Day Adventists. You had uh, the rise of uh, the uh, church in Salt Lake City, the Latter Day Saints. Uh, Joseph Smith said, "I will hear of the messenger of God if I live to be," and it was beyond the year 19 or 1892. And all of these things come up at that time. There was great agitation around the globe. In uh, England, there was a Jewish scholar who wrote about the second coming of Christ that would occur in the year 1863. He didn't recognize the first coming, but he was writing about the second coming. All through this is a tradition of teaching that comes through from God that there will always be another messenger. In the case of Baha'u'llah, he said that there will be one that will come after the passage of at least a thousand years. His teachings are for the unification of the world. Christ taught to the city-state. Muhammad created what we now have become fully aware of in the Western world, the Islamic nation. Moses talked to the tribes. Each step in human involvement has also brought a messenger of God to address those issues as we come forward into the present age. So from the word that comes from your, your faith, it, it would be a, a long time before you would have that particular identifiable leader uh, if, if you're dealing with a thousand years. With that. That's correct. Before there'd be another one who would come who would take a new title, uh, that's correct. We Baha'u'llah is for this period of time, there will be another to follow after him. His, like I said, his teachings are for the day in which we live. Uh, Abraham and, and Moses would have had a hard time talking to us in a nuclear age. Baha'u'llah talks about that. Another thing that comes to mind, and, and you triggered some thinking from the show that was done years ago uh, when we had one of the leaders from the Middle East on the program. Uh, I remember uh, asking at that time that it seems that within your faith there is suggestions, and correct me if I'm wrong, of somewhat an integration of different religions. I, most organized religions recognize uh, within their faith a real uniqueness from other religions. For example, in Christianity it's Jesus Christ, uh, in other religions it's Buddha and so forth. But it sounds like from not only this program but one that I did before, that you have some kind of integration and that you recognize uh, religious uh, prophets from different religions. It, it, is, is there some attempt in the Baha'i faith to integrate all the religions of the world? Well, it, not to integrate, but just to add to. It's like going through the school system. Again, I have to use that analogy. It's the most graphic and complete. Uh, we have to put ourselves, if you will, back at the time when Jesus spoke in Jerusalem. He spoke to the Jewish population primarily, although the Romans were there, but he spoke primarily to the Jewish population. The Jewish people and their traditions were what the roots that Jesus came from. And so when they talked, they talked from this tradition. And he built upon, he said, Moses said, I was coming, I'm here. This is my, at this time, I am the truth, the way, and the light. But there I will return again. And he talks about this renewal of religion through the ages, and this is what we believe in. So we believe that religion is one throughout the world. It's a oneness. Man has unfortunately set up the fact that I am Christian or I am Muslim and stopped. For the Baha'is, yes, all a Baha'i means by terminology is, I am a follower of the glory. It means I follow the glory. Baha but, means glory. But you put all of these on, on an equal level. That's you correct. Put, uh, your leaders are Christ or Buddha. That's correct. Mm -hmm. They're all on the same plane as messengers of God. They had different messages. They could have taught us the same things. But it would have been very difficult for Moses to talk to the tribes of, of Egypt, or the, the Jewish tribes coming out of Egypt, about the troubles and strifes in North America. The world didn't know about North America at that time, or at least the majority of the world didn't know at that time. There were a few people that we believe were sailing around at that time, but we're not sure. <laughs> now, Bert. Okay, I'd like to start with, with Peter, and then we'll move over to Carol. Um, in talking about the religions, let's do some comparative analysis. How is your religion similar, and how is it different to other religions? And, and let's start with Peter, and then maybe Carol can add. Let's start with how is it similar to other religions? All the religions that have come through the ages, the, basically there's nine major religions, there's many other groups that we don't understand. We don't have a lot of knowledge about the North American religions, etc. But all of the major religions have talked about the go similar comments of the Golden Rule. You can look at them in the Zendavesta, the Bhagavad Gita, all of the re religious teachings. The Baha'i Faith teaches that do more unto others than you would be done by. It's a common thread that runs through them all. The oneness of God, there's always one God. It taught, they all refer to the religions that have come before them and that they are part of the truth that is built to their age. 
Christ talks of Moses. The three kings were Zoroastrians who followed their religion to find Christ. When Muhammad came in the Holy Scripture, the Quran, it states that the religions of God are the Jewish faith, the Christian faith, and Islam. And it comes forward to that. We have a complete wholeness of religion. That's a basic tenet of the Baha'i faith. Another tenet of the Baha'i faith is that we are all one human family and that we are to strive for peace and harmony throughout that human family. And we are to eliminate our prejudices of all kinds. And that's a basic tenet of the faith, is to work to the elimination of these prejudices. Carol, can you think of some ways in which? Um, I really can't add too much to that other than um, that all of the former uh, manifestations of God, uh, uh, Buddha, Christ, uh, did speak of what would be the spiritual truths that have not changed, such as um, uh, love and, um, oh, I guess you could go back to the, the Ten Commandments. Those are pretty universal uh, uh, and are spoken of as like eternal spiritual truths. The things that make for the differences are, again, because of the times and the needs of the people, and therefore social laws are what are the new things that are given with each manifestation so that, that each uh, uh, community can um, carry for uh, the, the term is carry forward an ever advancing civilization rather than staying back in superstition and traditions as our uh, knowledge of science grows we can progress and so those uh, new teachings happen uh, to address the uh, issues uh, of a modern time. Well, now let's start with you this mm -hmm. time and tell us some ways that the Baha'i faith is different, perhaps, than some other religions. Some things that are unique about your faith. Um, historically, when the message was first given, probably one of uh, the most startling principles was the equality of men and women. At the time when it was given in uh, Persia, Iran, uh, women uh, pretty much were property, they had no rights, um, and for a progressive uh, religion at that time to say that women have the capacity, if they are given the education, to excel, uh, some at greater degrees than others just as each individual has their own capacity to excel, but women should be educated. Um, in fact, if uh, a family could own a, they had a, a son and a daughter, and they could only choose to educate one of their children financially. They would educate their daughter first, mainly because she is the first educator of the child. And I see uh, in recent uh, documentation from the World Health Organization that they are stating that, indeed, the higher level of education the woman has, the higher level the children also will attain. So uh, in the 1800s, to say that women should be educated so that they can fulfill their potential and their capacity is, is pretty um, new and exciting. And, and Peter, what about you? What are some ways that you can think of that are well, different? The Baha'i Faith doesn't have a clergy. I'm not a clergyman, and neither is, is mm -hmm. Carol. Mm -hmm. We are, are just lay people. We are enjoined under one of the tenets <coughs> of the Baha'i Faith, which is that we individually investigate truth for ourselves. And we are constantly on a study path to understand our religion and understand the other religions that are now on the face of the earth that are actually a continuum, so that we understand the perspective of human development. In that capacity, many of us have become teachers as we go along. Each individual Baha'i becomes a teacher as they are progressing in their life in this plane of existence. And one of the things that Baha'u'llah did is he addressed the clergy and said that today, this generation from 1863 forward, as we progress, must become educated and that man must be able to communicate with God on his own. He doesn't need clergy anymore. So he called for, and in this was very radical in Persia at the time, uh, because the Shahs, the Ayatollahs, uh, controlled the country, and he said that these Ayatollahs must come down out of their priesthood and join the general population and be involved with the public at large and not be cloistered away in their own temples and synagogues. And he therefore abandoned the church uh, uh, clergy. That was a very radical thing to do. There are many lay churches today that we know of through Christianity, but the, in 1863 this was not the common, and that's the way it is today in the Baha'i community. 
I cannot resist asking you another question with regard to social services. Many churches have social services. Does your church also involve itself in social services for both families within your own group and also outside the, the faith itself? As the Baha'i community grows, there's a 1,400 local spiritual assemblies across the United States just in our area alone. And as the Baha'i community grows uh, beyond nine, the assemblies are formed. The assemblies then begin to set up structured marriage counseling, child guidance. Uh, we bring in the professionals from all walks of life that will aid and bear on a particular issue that we're addressing. And that service is available both to Baha'is and non-Baha'is alike. Uh, we oftentimes, because of the fewness of numbers in our communities, when you're only nine, and many times it, all of us working and eking out a living, uh, we have obtained the information of what social services are available and encourage and work with people to use those services. As our community gets larger uh, in population, you will find that there are all kinds of programs, schools, uh, administrative structures to aid in the education of children, uh, the development of the family structure, et cetera. And, and do you have missionaries, uh, the, uh, the same kind of individual as a missionary, do you have missionary services where you go out into the world, something of that nature? There are individuals or families who uh, may, what we, the term is pioneer to a country. The differences between that and what we normally think of as missionaries is that we're not going there paid to do just that. We might seek to go to a country to establish ourselves in that community as a, a, a regular citizen, have a, a, a job, commun uh, contribute to the community at large, and in the process, those that we come in contact with may then ask us, well, what brought you to this country? And in that way, we are able to share uh, the Baha'i faith with them. But uh, it, there is a little bit difference between um, what I, I would think of as the classic uh, terminology for missionary versus a pioneer of the Baha'i faith who goes to live in that country uh, probably until they die. Something else that we have certainly learned about organized religion, and you both are doing a very outstanding job of making some of those comparisons, but most organized religions historically that have been with us a long time have a fundamental uh, source, uh, the Bible, uh, that they go to as the key a scripture, and then they have a lot of other writings and publications that evolve around that. Uh, is that true of the Baha'i faith? Uh, Baha'u'llah wrote, I believe, over a hundred volumes or tablets and letters, so we do have um, many, many volumes of his writings. Uh, also, we have those who uh, in uh, uh, intellectual realms will expound on those writings or compile them in, in different ways in order to address maybe social issues. Um, so we do have, uh, yes, the writings available to us. We also will use those writings of all of the major religions, mainly because all religion is one and therefore those uh, religions also have validity as, as to their holy scripture. I think that's a, a distinction in your religion for some because in some religions they will refer to their own writings and, and, uh, and of their prophets, but they do not incorporate into that religion other prophets from other religions. Mm -hmm. And you're not defensive with that at all. No. In fact, usually in uh, a community where there is education, spiritual education for the children, they will study all of the religions. That way, they are uh, able to discern for themselves uh, the truth and see that there really is a connectedness and a oneness between the religion of God. One thing we've learned about both religion and politics, if you look at the Constitution of the United States, we have some rather lively debates in interpreting certain <laughs> amendments to the Constitution, for example, or in the same way in religion. If you get into a discussion and uh, somewhat of a disagreement on the interpretation of some of the writings, how do you resolve that interpretation? Does the Council of the Universal House of Justice have any authority to make uh, any final interpretation? It's the ultimate authority on the faith and on the writings. Mm -hmm. And they use the collective works of Baha'u'llah to do that. And uh, you know, we have to remember that in the Baha'i dispensation, the works that we have available are in the archives from the, the founder of the Baha'i faith. 
And so they refer to the original text as to mm -hmm. various questions that come up. And while he wrote over 100 volumes, and we're talking large, large books such as these that are mm -hmm. here in Carol's lap, he also wrote over 14,000 letters of guidance to particular questions that were asked of him. Many of those are still in the process of being translated from the original Persian and the original Arabic mm -hmm. into the language which the Universal House of Justice is currently using, which is English for all its uh, international communications. And so, yes, they're there. If we have a question between, so for instance, if Carol and I should have a question of, of uh, text that we were in, uh, wondering the uh, particular guidance that we should use, we might debate it for quite a while. But if it required some action and we couldn't come to a resolution, it would be referred to our local assembly, who might then in turn refer it to the national and then on to the Universal House of Justice. Okay. There's another thing I want to cover before time is up. I know, Peter, you handed me before the program. Uh, a booklet entitled The Promise of World Peace to the Peoples of the World. It's a statement by the Universal House of Justice. Can you give us a little background? I'll show this uh, on the monitor. Uh, when was this published and how is, has it been distributed? The original text was written in 1984 by the Universal House of Justice. We have to remember this was before Perestroika, before the wall in Berlin came down, before Russia and the United States joined forces with the United Nations to deal with the uh, situation in the Middle East that we're currently looking at, uh, before much of the unification of the world has taken place in the last five years took place. When the Universal House of Justice wrote this publication, it is addressed to the people of the world, not to the leaders. It was given originally to the leaders of the world, including uh, Gor Mr. Gorbachev and Mr. Bush, and prior to him, uh, Mr. Reagan. And in each case, as you go through, mm -hmm. it talks about the principles that are necessary for mankind to achieve uh, unity in the planet. One of those necessities is the elimination of racism, in the, in, in, particularly in North America, where it runs quite rapid, but it is also throughout the world. That's one principle the Baha'is are working towards, is the elimination of racism. Also, the international establishment of a universal language, one language that we can adhere to so that we can communicate. Uh, we have, as you are aware from the me recent media, several translators trying to talk as reporters from one country or another are asking questions and the speaker is either French, Russian, or uh, Kuwaiti. So we're having a number of different languages. We're learning that we do need a common language to communicate, a universal system of weights and measures, a universal monetary system. Uh, these are all principles that the Universal House of Justice has addressed that we need to incorporate in a world embracing, world embodying unity of mankind. And are you predicting that with some of those developments, like in the Soviet Union, that there's a movement in that direction? Well, I'm not saying that there's a movement in that direction, but the surface information that we receive is that there is much more freedoms are being offered, and yet there are still constraints. We're a long ways from a world at peace, but we are progressing. I have to interrupt. I'm sorry. I must do so. I've got the signal that the time is up. I want to thank both of you for being our guests today and Janelle for fine questions. Ladies and gentlemen, Thank I hope you. you've enjoyed our program, and from time to time we will look at different religions in the world. I think that's one topic among others that you find interesting, and today it happened to be the Baha'i Faith. I would like to wish you a wonderful week, and please join us again next week at this same time. I am Tony Stewart. North Idaho College Public Forum is videotaped live by Telemedia Services on the campus of North Idaho College for viewing at this more appropriate time. We invite you to catch the North Idaho College Public Forum the same time next week on this television station.